भाइयों और बहनों राष्ट्रपति जी ने आपत्काल की घोषणा की है इससे गांधी जी ने एक बार कहा कि जवाहरलाल में और मुझ में ये भेद है कि जवाहरलाल चाहता है कि अंग्रेजों को यहाँ से निकाल दिया जाए लेकिन अंग्रेजियत को यहाँ रखना चाहता है और मैं अंग्रेजियत निकालना चाहता हूँ अंग्रेज रहे हमारे मित्र बन करके तो हमें कोई इंसान Well, I don't see anything positive, really. Um, the only positive thing possible is after the emergency. It was very difficult to promote any kind of authoritarian regime. You know, it, it was a kind of antidote. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Namaste. I am Mithilesh. Welcome you all to a new episode of the Eastern Report. Today we have with us noted historian Sri Kristof Jeffrelo on our show. Welcome, Jeffrelo. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Today we will discuss Jeffrelo's book, India's First Dictatorship: The Emergency, 1975. 1977 In June 1975 Prime Minister Indira Gandhi imposed a state emergency resulting in a 21 month suspension of democracy across India Bhaiyon aur behno Rashtrapati ji ne aapatkal ki ghoshna ki hai Isse Christopher Jefferlo and Pratino Anil explore this back phase in India's history a constitutional dictatorship of unequal impact with south india largely spared thanks to indian federalism christoph jefferlo is research director at seri sciences po and professor of indian politics and sociology at kings india institute his most recent book is majoritarian state here is the book this is the best book and most wide ranging account of the subject i request my viewers to read this book and immerse themselves into the thrilling account of emergency so jeffrelo what motivated you to write about india's first dictatorship well there is a long history behind this book because in fact i started to work on it on the emergency in the late 90s when my publisher um who was uh, and who still is uh, michael dwyer uh, with earth uh, invited me to uh, uh, write a book on the emergency because there was no book on the emergency at that time mm. so we had uh, this project and um, i started working on it but uh, the um, life is always taking you in other directions so i in fact uh, embarked on another project a biography of ambedkar and then a book on the obcs to cut a long story short mm -hmm. i returned to this project only after discovering a gold mine mm -hmm. that is the um, uh, earrings of the shah commission the shah commission we will return to it was the commission appointed after the emergency for investigated on the on the emergency and granville austin uh, a senior most scholar uh, in the us mm -hmm. had collected all these earrings yet been given a copy of all these earrings and had handed over his pride papers to john hopkins university where i taught mm -hmm. with sunil kilnani in the uh, years uh, 2010 2011 then i returned to this project and with pratinav who had been my student at sciences po uh, we used these sources and others for finalizing this book uh, in uh, in fact a very short span of time it took us only uh, two years to to complete what is in fact a very detailed account of the emergency 
so what challenges did you face uh, right, uh, during writing this book well, one of the challenges when you do history mm. kind of history mm -hmm. uh, of that sort is um how far can you rely on what people remember right and um, you know for such a controversial phase of indian history right. you really cannot rely on what on people's memories so after interviewing few people we decided to work more on the basis of archives interviews were fine and uh, i had interviewed old timers uh, among the opposition parties mostly uh, LK Advani, Madulimai, socialists as well as Zansangis and so on. But most of the book is based on archives. And uh, that was a challenge also to, to, right. of another kind, right. but, um, but much more reliable. Right. And so finding the, the people who were present in 1975 alive when you started uh, the book, might be challenging, right? That's why, in fact, most of these interviews took place when I had initiated the project in the 90s. Because yeah. at that time, uh, all these old timers, Madhu Dandavate, mm. uh, Surendar Mohan, um, Atal Jarid Vajpayee, mm. uh, were still alive. Mm. Uh, Rajmata Sindhya. So all these people, we in I interviewed them um, when... Um, uh, I started the project in the in, in the nineties. Okay, uh, so in modern days, we have seen various kind of dictatorship, like communist dictatorship, military dictatorship. But why this dictatorship in India is called constitutional dictatorship? Well, it, it is called like that because Mrs. Gandhi uh, did not transgress the constitution of India. You know, it, there was nothing illegal right. in this emergency. Right. Uh, it was declared uh, according to a specific article, Article 352 of the constitution. Right. The parliament uh, voted, right. passed this uh, decision, validated this right. decision. The parliament, by the way, continued to, to work there, there were sessions in the Lok Sabha, in the Rajya Sabha. The mm -hmm. parliamentary work continued. Mm -hmm. The judiciary itself was not directly affected. The Supreme Court continued to do um, its job. So you, you have a very specific brand of, uh, um, you can say, uh, dictatorship or authoritarian regime. And, and Mrs. Gandhi could even say, an extra constitutional challenge was constitutionally met because she considered that the opposition demonstrating in the streets were anti-constitutional when what she did was in tune with, with the constitution and she was she was well partly true, partly right. So we're starting from the beginning. So when Indra Gandhi uh, introduced or enacted this emergency. So her uh, statement was, some people talk of revolution, as per your book, our government has already begun one. So this was the initial remark by Indira Gandhi. So was this a revolution? No, it was not a revolution. But but you see, you see what she wanted to mean, what mm -hmm. she wanted to say. She wanted to say this emergency regime is intended to deliver for the poor. Mm -hmm. So she was, in fact, pursuing the same vein as in 1971, when she adopted the Garibi Atao motto. Mm -hmm. And she tried to justify the regime that she uh, had established uh, by saying, you see, we have followed the Western system, mm -hmm. legal system. That protects rights, but by protecting rights, we have protected property. And, and she, she emphasized this in um, many of her speeches, and 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 implicitly or sometimes explicitly, she meant that 
now the poor will have their share. They will get their due, which is, of course, um, partly true. The 20 points that she presented as her program had few items in favor of, of the poor in terms of land redistribution, in terms of outside redistribution and distribution and so on. But it's primarily a conservative regime, a regime which benefited the owners of factories, businessmen at large, um, because there were draconian measures taken for preventing strikes, the number of strikes. And there were many strikes in the early 70s, uh, including in the railways and so on. But the number of strikes diminished drastically because it was very difficult to be on strike. And <laughs> in the first place, trade unionists were behind bars. So all the leaders uh, had, had been uh, leaders of the workers had been in prison. So no, it's not a revolution. If it is a, very, a revolution, it is a conservative revolution, if you want, um, for making social economic status quo uh, even even more obvious, um, with some caveats. And and I and I really want to emphasize one caveat: there was some land redistribution because it was much easier for Mrs. Gandhi to twist the arm of landlords um, when she did not have to contest elections. You know, one of the big problems in India in the 70s is vote bank politics. You need the vote of the peasants. To get the vote of the peasants, you need the landlords. And when you send landlords to the parliament, why should landlords pass land reform laws? There was no parliament. I mean, the parliament had been emasculated, so she could, she could twist, she could um, twist the arms of of the landlords, but to a certain extent only. And 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 it's not it's not a revolution. Uh, talking about the land reform, right? Uh, so even the land reform is not implemented till today in India. Like most of uh, states, some states implemented. And uh, some state uh, haven't implemented. Like there is upper capping, but that is there. But uh, like giving the all your land at single place, it's not implemented. And there is hard uh, in north. It's a, like a very good, a very tough resistance. Even the current government or 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 any party tried to do. It's very difficult. So what she did and she tried to did was quite remarkable. But uh, it was not a, re a revolution that you say. So there were large scale. Subversion of institution of democracy. So please tell us uh, that, that what kind, of, what all institutions were subverted due to this emergency. Well, first of all, many institutions had become redundant. Yeah. For instance, there was no election worth that name. First right. of all, Lok Sabha elections were postponed two times, right. and uh, as a result you did not need any election commission. That was the basic institution, a very important institution of Indian democracy, that had become redundant. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the uh, judiciary somewhat shot in its foot, shot in its foot. And, and uh, it, it's a very important point to keep in mind because it, it's a lesson uh, for today as well. Right. The judiciary had not been um, at the, under attack. You know, there was no frontal attack on the judiciary. The same people were there uh, before June 75 and, and, and after June 75. Right. But the judges, the, ju the justices, somewhat preferred to bow to the government instead of resisting the government. Incidentally, very few lawyers resigned. The, the only one who did uh, was Palina Riman. Uh, mm -hmm. All the others preferred to go along with the regime. Right. And they went, to, they went very far because they validated 
all the reforms, all the amendments to the constitution. And the worst was even elsewhere in the way they considered that that habeas corpus mm -hmm. was not necessary anymore. Mm -hmm. And when the uh, government argued that there is no personal right in the context of the emergency, uh, Santi Bushan and, and Soli Sorabji objected and went to court, but the court by four against one, you remember that only Justice Kana saved the, honor, saved the honor of the court, but four against one said, yes, there is no abuse corpus left. Nobody had forced them to say that. Right. Right. It's the judiciary itself that preferred to fall in line. Right. So it's a very complicated situation. You, 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 you can say institutions were under pressure. Mm -hmm. You can also say many institutions did not try to resist and preferred to fall in line. And, and in this book, we emphasize this dimension. Why so few people resisted? Right. Why? this commitment to democracy appeared so shallow. Why liberty was not something valorized, valued to such an extent that you, you protect them and the judiciary is supposed to protect them. And, and we have a, a chapter on precisely uh, some uh, explanation in terms of political culture, but we may return to that. So uh, Sanjay Gandhi's role in emergency, right? Sanjay Gandhi, Desh Kaneta, Nojwano Kaneta. और जो कार्यक्रम लिए हैं युवा कांग्रेस में, उसमें एक कार्यक्रम है जो हिंदुस्तान के लिए बहुत ही जरूरी है। वो कार्यक्रम है परिवार नियोजन का। So it's widely debated even today. So please tell about about his personality and how he was the man behind this all. Emergency thing. Well, it, it was not behind the wall emergency, but uh, it is true that gradually he asserted himself, and uh, Mrs. Gandhi relied on him more and more. She felt more and more isolated, and by '76, uh, yes, he was much more influential, and he was a very specific character. There is one good. Uh, biography of Sanjay Gandhi by Vinod Mehta. You mm -hmm. know, one, one of these very rare biographies in India, because most of biographies are agiographies in India. You, are, you yeah. have very few critical biographies. This one is a critical biography, but a very, a very balanced one. Mm -hmm. And it shows that uh, in the first place, Sanjay Gandhi was, was a very lonely child. Um, his mother not taking care of him, so he was in boarding school. Then he went to UK, he worked with Rolls Royce because he loved cars. When he came back, Mrs. Gandhi started Maruti uh, for that very reason, that uh, car, uh, cars were his passion. And uh, when in 75, uh, she was under pressure because of the Allahabad High Court judgment, because of uh, the demonstrations of uh, uh, the opposition in the street. He stood by her, and she was always worried about who could really support her. You know, that, that's a, a, a stigma of the very complicated start she had, because uh, when she became Prime Minister of India, she was not really supported by the congressmen, I mean, the uh, the leaders of the Congress party. They wanted to use her. They did not want to obey her. So she, she had this feeling of insecurity. She was a very insecure Prime Minister uh, till, till at least the, the early 70s. And, and that continued, in fact. So she really established a kind of duo with Sanjay, uh, who could benefit from this. 
and um, and he was he was um, very you can say ruthless, mm. and um, decided to, to to form a kind of parallel government mm. Mm. with people who were equally ruthless. Um, people who had hardly any pre-college education, Bon Silal, for instance, the mm -hmm. Ariana chief minister who was to become defense minister. Mm -hmm. Gradually, he pushed his, these people, this clique, uh, mm -hmm. and he focused on, on, on two things on, with their support. Mm -hmm. One was beautification of Delhi. He wanted to transform Delhi into uh, the ideal city. And that's how uh, anti-encroachment drives took place, and in particular in uh, Kashmiri Gate in, in, in Delhi. And the other thing he was very much obsessed with was uh, the demographic uh, transformation of India. So he wanted to control population. Family planning became his other uh, obsession. By the way, it was there before. Mm. Uh, family planning was already one of the main priorities of Indira Gandhi before. But mm. he made it uh, he, he developed that uh, at another level. So you add sterilization programs. During the emergency, 11 million people were sterilized. Mm -hmm. And that was largely because of him. Mm -hmm. So he was this kind of dictator. He was this kind of uh, person to whom Indira could never say no. And, and that was the tragedy because uh, he realized, but very late in the day, that he was um, taking the country to some disaster. I think she realized mm -hmm. that she would be also uh, at the receiving end because of him. And I think it's one of the reasons why she lifted the emergency and organized elections um, in order to, to let people say no to Sanjay because she could not say no to Sanjay herself. Adding to that, uh, so if suppose uh, hypothetical situation, if there is some other leader in place of Indira Gandhi and the sim similar uh, scenario prevails, so is emergency could be possible? So is it due to Indira Gandhi personality? Well, you can say it is partly due to a personality for the reasons I have mentioned uh, before, this sense of uh, insecurity. Uh, you need to re remember the, the context, you know. She had been punished by the judiciary in the Halabad High Court case. And uh, she was supposed to resign from um, at least a job, a role as 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 prime minister, uh, till she could uh, wait for she could get uh, uh, the appeal. She was on appeal to the Supreme Court, and she was so uncertain about the decision of the Supreme Court uh, on appeal that she preferred to uh, declare the emergency. So you can certainly say that yes, uh, her personality a sense of insecurity precipitated the emergency. But you can also say something else. You can say that she was already so much in common. You know, the Congress party after 69 had let her concentrate so much power in her hands mm -hmm. that structurally nobody could object anything to her decision to suspend democracy. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the party was already a kind of pyramid on its head. Everything was in her hands. So she appointed chief ministers, she changed chief ministers and ministers, of course. No, when, when she declared the emergency, she should have consulted the cabinet before. She consulted the cabinet after after the night during which the right. declaration had been made. And in this council cabinet meeting, nobody 
said anything. Swaran Singh was the only one who raised his voice. He was to be dismissed soon after. And he was the only one. Why? Because power were already concentrated in her hands. So it's not only her personality, it's also the transformation of the party into a very, you can say, patrimonial instrument uh, that, that made the emergency possible. Yeah, so uh, just like uh, giving one reference, like coming from Sastri, like the personality Sastri was, and after Indira Gandhi, the complete transformation of a party, the grand old party of India. Like, So if, suppose, like Sastri was alive, this, this uh, scenario would, won't have taken place. Like Exactly. Then, because because be, be, uh, between Shastri and Indira Gandhi, you had the 1969 split. Right. And that split made a huge difference. The party used to be a party of notables right. with buses, party buses right. at the helm of uh, regions, states. Right. And uh, Nehru and Shastri had to negotiate with these people. You know, they, that's how they could uh, retain their power. And it was very much collegial in that sense. Right. After the split, Indra decided to go to the people directly and she short-circuited all these party buses because the party buses had stayed with the Congress hope. Right. Instead, she uh, appointed her own uh, psychophants and she could win elections not by relying on party cadres or right. buses, right. but by relating to the people directly. This is the first phase of populism in India. We, we are now living the second phase of populism in India. Right. That first phase. Why emergency was a North Indian phenomenon? It's a very good question. It's, it, it was a little bit more than that, but it is true that uh, the epicenter was Delhi, Haryana, West UP. And I think it's largely due to the lack of capability of the state. You no, know, it was not a very uh, strong state <laughs> in, in the sense that uh, uh, it was around Delhi where uh, Sanjay had his, had, his, had his supporters that it worked the, the, the best. Uh, in, in the South, uh, first of all, there were alternative parties, mm. DMK in Tamil Nadu. DMK was ruling mm. Tamil Nadu. Yeah. So clearly, uh, it, it was difficult for Congress to encroach on, on, on the state. And secondly, you have some resilient party bosses in some of the southern states. Hmm? Devraj Urs in Karnataka, he was certainly a congressman, but with a lot of autonomy. So when you did not have the psychophant of the duo, uh, Mrs. Gandhi and her son, you could see people resisting more effectively. And that's what we saw in the South. Uh, same in Kerala, um, to a large extent. So it was indeed uh, not something the South was so exposed to. And in fact, in 77, when there were elections for the first time since 71, the Congress party did well in the South. It lost elections because of the North, because in the North, the emergency had resulted in mass sterilization and many other um, atrocious policies. But they were not that wrong in the South, these policies. So never forget that Congress lost in the North and lost power because of the North, but won in the South, and Mrs. Gandhi could be elected in a by-election in Karnataka for this very reason uh, in 78. So JP movement is widely seen as the major catalyst behind the sudden imposition of emergency. So what were all uh, immediate uh, causes behind this emergency? Yes, that, that was one of the causes. Um, the JP movement was in fact prepared by a two states movement, one in Gujarat yes. as early as 73, 74, and the other one in Bihar. And of course, Bihar was JP's state. So when the movement spread to Bihar, uh, JP took the lead and, and became the uh, 
leader. Well, this movement is a very complex movement. It's spontaneous to begin with, against corruption, against uh, inequalities. Um, it's a student's movement uh, to a large extent. Um, students are particularly upset by, by corruption, rise of prices, but but others join hands with them. Gandhi ji ne ek baar kaha ki Jawaharlal me aur mujh me ye bhed hai ki Jawaharlal chahta hai ki angrezon ko yahan se nikal diya jaye lekin angreziyat ko yahan rakhna chahta hai. Aur main angreziyat nikalna chahta hu angrez rahe hamare mitra ban kar ke to hame koi inkar nahi. Ab Jawaharlal ji ke samne wo Europe ka America ka wo sara lagta hai. दो सौ वर्ष से वो आगे जा रहे हैं हम भी आगे थे उस जमाने में यूरोप से कोई कम भारत नहीं था दुनिया के किसी देश से जब अंग्रेज यहाँ आए थे उस समय हम उनके किसी के पीछे नहीं थे आगे ही थे और बहुत कुछ उन लोगों ने सीखा और बाद में इस तरह से हमें दबाया और बर्बाद किया कि हम क्या थे ये भी हम भूल गए that is supported by well-oiled machineries, including, of course, RSS, RSS, a BVP, um, will very quickly support these movements at the state level and then at, and then at the national level. Nanaji Deshmukh, whom I interviewed uh, for, for this book, uh, was the RSS person who will become the right-hand man of JP. Uh, in, in, in BR especially and elsewhere. And then, thirdly, other opposition parties will rally around uh, JP, including uh, Congress O, uh, Charan Singh, uh, the Socialists, when well, JP being a socialist himself, of course. Uh, so he will, he will get mass support political support, and therefore will pose a threat to Mrs. Gandhi. And also because in um, June 75, Gujarat, the place where it started in the first place, uh, is won by Moharji Desai, the Congress O-leader. And she realizes that electorally these people are meaning business, and she may lose one state after the other if that continues. So she was really um, the back to the wall. And uh, in this context, when the Allahabad High Court uh, considered that she um, had resorted to corrupt practices in the 71 elections, in this context, uh, she declared the emergency to, to serve her skin politically. I, I think she thought she, she had to do it to, to survive politically. All right. Uh, so, despite this major opposition, right, Indira Gandhi got support from parties like CPI, Siu Shena, and like others. So, how come she was uh, able to garner such political support? Well, she, support, she, she received support from many different quarters. And, and this, is, this is typical of authoritarian regimes without any clear ideology. There is no ideology behind the emergence. And as a result, you have people coming from many different quarters. CPI is one, because for CPI, this is the great opportunity to indulge in um, forms of redistribution. I mean, yep. at least land reform is something they believe in and they are confident that it will happen. Mm. Yeah, CPI. Uh, Indrajit Gupto, for instance, and others are, are, are confident that it will deliver. But you have also Sif Sena. Sif Sena is supporting uh, mm. the emergency for completely different reasons, mm. uh, and primarily because of fear, fear of being banned. Right. And thirdly, uh, you have this um, other surprising Maharashtrian party, RPI, uh, one of 
the largest factions of RPI, the party that uh, Baba Seb Ambedkar had created, rallying around uh, the emergency, also in the name of uh, uh, populist, you can say, pro-poor policies. But that's for the political parties. You have also all kinds of individuals uh, rallying around the emergency for, for all kinds of reasons. Jack Mohan, the bureaucrat who was in charge of urban planning in Delhi, will become the right-hand man of, um, um, one of the right-hand men of, of Sanjay, because he thinks that the kind of authority he commands will make the cleaning of Delhi possible. Mm. And then you have also the um, businessmen. Mm. So many businessmen will be more than happy to celebrate the emergency. Uh, KK Birla, uh, JRD Tata, so many businessmen will consider that an era of discipline has come, and that will be good for production. Era of discipline, of course, is the key word that Mrs. Gandhi will use repeatedly, and, and there is even a book uh, that she prefaced uh, um, with this title. Businessmen, many businessmen will, will rally around the emergency uh, because they were afraid for their business, of course, but also because they thought that, uh, yes, at last, after so many years of strikes, of disorder, uh, it will work. And that is something you will see beyond the uh, elite uh, of, of India. The middle class, middle, middle class people um, consider that, yes, at last, uh, trends are on time. Mm -hmm. So the coalition, the coalition, you can say political as well as social, behind the emergency is very large. It's absolutely uh, uh, unprecedented, in fact, uh, in terms of the, 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 the large, I mean, the, the scope from CPI to Jerry Tata. When in India have we seen Jerry Tata and CPI following the same leader? Mm. You, have to, you have to go back in history for five years. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, correct, correct. Yes, so uh, going back to that Allahabad High Court decision, right? So it was uh, like very hard on a prime minister that your election is being uh, uh, discarded by a uh, honorable court. So uh, given that scenario, like uh, uh, was there any alternative uh, for Mrs. Gandhi to remain alive in politics and then again come back to power if possible? So please discuss about that. Yeah, no, she could. She could have uh, decided to bow to um, what the court uh, had said. Mm -hmm. She could have waited for the final decision by the Supreme Court. And if she had been obliged to um, resign, she could have contested again. Mm -hmm. That was one of the possibilities. But as I said, she was so insecure that she, first of all, did not trust the court as a neutral uh, body. And secondly, she was also not so sure that her own party would not replace her at the moment she would have left the scene. And thirdly, she, even if the party was behind her, she did not know whether there would be free and fair elections because the opposition was was um, very much after her. Maraji Desai himself, in June, said, we know that we have to resort to other means for getting rid of Mrs. Gandhi because electoral competition will not do. Well, if he was prepared to resort to other means, then, of course, she had good reasons also for being afraid. And at the same time, Marty Desai and, uh, uh, and others were uh, mentioning the fact that the army could be invited right. to some mutiny. So, for all these reasons, he preferred not to take the risk of 
going to the decision of the judiciary. So, so there are like uh, rumors or some like where I read that even Manik Shaw was invited or he was interested to come for mutiny, but it, it never materialized and there is no uh, concrete proof of that. So it's just a rumor. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so why is the coming to the res resistant part, right? Even the resistant was not even. It was there prominent in Bihar and Gujarat, but throughout the India, it was not even. So what were the reason for that? Well, if you look at those who resisted the emergency and fought against um, Mrs. Gandhi, you have, again, uh, a mosaic um, of people, very diverse. Of course, the group which is systematically referred to is RSS, because RSS um, had a large body of very disciplined right. volunteers, and they could go underground very soon after the emergency was declared. Many of them, something like 2,500 people, were sent to jail, but many others went underground and were in a position to, to resist um, to help the families of those who had been arrested, uh, to relate to the diaspora for getting help, for getting funds. But interestingly, they were more interested in fighting for the organization than for democracy. And uh, Baba Seb Deoras, the leader of RSS, who was in jail, sent two letters to Mrs. Gandhi, asking for mercy, asking for a legalization of uh, RSS in exchange of some support. He said, we can work together. You can rely on us, but please make us free again. So RSS fought the emergency, no doubt about that, but not necessarily for democracy. Yes. Another group that was much smaller, but probably more active than any others, was made of socialists, yes. including, of course, George Fernandez, uh, whose brothers were tortured, um, Lawrence especially, yes. because uh, the police was after George Fernandez more than anybody else. Yes. But uh, nobody said anything. And um, they could they could orchestrate some sabotage, some um, operation, and he, and he was he, he was arrested at the end of the emergency. So that's another group, and the third group, which is very often neglected, even sometimes uh, ignored, are the Sikh of the Akalida. Mm -hmm. The Sikh uh, people in Punjab were very active against the emergency as a group. Of, of course, you have, you have individuals, all kinds of individuals. But these are the three groups, if you want. Mm -hmm. RSS, socialists, and, and, and Sikh uh, Akalis, mostly. Um, in addition to that, you have so many individuals of all kinds who try to do something, who try their best. But 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 most of the observers were surprised to see that uh, there were not more. There was not a massive upsurge. Um, Kuldeep Nayar, for instance, uh, the journalist who has written uh, one of the best accounts of the emergency, had not anticipated so much passivity. And uh, not only among the laymen, but among the journalists, the media person, because the same way lawyers somewhat remain passive, uh, many journalists um, indulge in self-censorship uh, and, and did not do as much as they could have done. There were a few exceptions, of course, Indian Express because of Ramnath Goenka mm -hmm. and Statesman. Uh, but uh, mm, as Kuldeep Nayar said, uh, we could have said many more things but we did not. Yeah, so coming towards the JP movement, uh, yeah, so uh, like uh, in India, right? Um, India of that time, especially, if something happens in India and uh, beyond control, like our leaders of that time used to resort uh, to blaming uh, FBI, KGB, and even uh, 
JP was level at a KG, uh, FBI agent. So was JP uh, JP got some assistance from FBI or uh, CIA or whatever? You know, it's very interesting because uh, this is the era of the foreign aid. Mrs. Gandhi was attributing everything that was wrong, that was posing a threat to her, to the CIA indeed, the foreign aid. American imperialism. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting because, in fact, the only evidence we have yes. of interferences by the CIA in the Indian domestic politics is in favor of Congress. Congress mm -hmm. benefited twice, if we go by the book by Daniel Moynihan, who was ambassador of the U.S. to India, mm -hmm. um, of financial support by the CIA. Mm -hmm. Congress. Mm. Not JP. Yes. We have no evidence. We have not find. We have not found anything proving mm -hmm. that the CIA was helping uh, JP. But the psychosis was very much there, largely because of what had happened in Chile. Yes. The, the way Allende had been eliminated by yes. the CIA, mm. and, and, and that was something eating the headlines in 74, 74, yes. 75. Yes. Plus, Mujibur Rahman assassinated yes. also in the summer of 75. Yes. Mrs. Gandhi could say, look, democratically elected leftist leaders of the world are under threat. I am one of them. Yes. They are after me. They want to kill me. So they, he, he kept repeating that. He, he said, they want to get rid of me. And the they was bracketing together American imperialists and Indian rightists. For them, they were part of the same world. Uh, they, they were those who are fighting against the people. And she was the one who was defending the people. But we have no evidence of the um, interference that CIA could have. Um, well, we have no evidence of support by the CIA. Uh, and, 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 and the US, the West at large, did not criticize the emergency for months. Mm -hmm. The British people, the British government kept mum and even supported Mrs. Gandhi. Jacques Chirac, the French Prime Minister, had an official visit in 76. You know, the West was not unhappy with the emergency. You have to wait for the New York Times reports, the um, Guardian reports, for the public opinion of Western societies to somewhat shift and therefore put pressure on their governments. But frankly speaking, uh, if if they had been against her, they would have said something different. So yeah, even so, that that that's a trend in political uh, system in India, right? People, if they are not able to del deliver, they will blame someone. Previously, they blame Britishers. Then, uh, like, so they have some space scapegoat. We say even yeah. uh, Anna Hazare was term a CIA agent. Yeah. And now they blame Nehru, but uh, yes, yes, yeah. So that blame goes, game goes on and on. So it's a vicious cycle that we have to suffer. Uh, yes, so now coming towards the end of emergency. So why in, uh, and how it got uh, lifted? Well, all of a sudden, in January 2077, Mrs. Gandhi announces that there'll be elections uh, in March and the, ele the emergency is lifted. Mm. Well, it's, it's important to emphasize the fact that she did it. So it's not because of RSS, the socialists, or the Akalis that the emergency was lifted. It, it could have continued for many months, maybe many years, who knows. Right. She decided to stop. Um, and there are many interpretations in the book. We, we list all the hypotheses, all the possibilities. I have mentioned one. Uh, 
he could not say no to Sanjay, and therefore she preferred the voters to say no to him. That's one possibility. Another one is um, he thought she would win. And the IB, Intelligence Bureau, apparently had uh, announced that it could work. Congress could be voted to power again. And she thought that by announcing elections so quickly, the opposition will not be in a position to, to put its house in order and uh, that would work. Thirdly, um, foreign foreign pressure, and and I mentioned the fact that the media uh, in the West were putting putting some pressure on the governments of the U.S., of U.K., of France. That is this is something that he paid a lot of attention to. He could not stand the way she was depicted, she was described in the media in the West, with this constant contrast. Jawaharlal Nehru, the founder of the Indian democracy, the true democrat, has been betrayed by her daughter, by his daughter. You know, I I do think that that was one of the uh, reasons why she also uh, lifted the emergency. And last but not least, Pakistan was about to vote. Yeah. And India could not vote or was apparently unable to return to democratic procedures, electoral procedures, when Pakistan uh, did it. So, it was something, again, vis-a-vis -vis the West, that she had to take care of. India has always been proud of being the largest democracy in the world. Even today, in spite of every evidence, this is a status, this is an image yes. uh, that, that they try to, to, to preserve. Yes. So for all these reasons, she took the risk and she lost. But she lost, I yes. repeat in spite of the support of the South. Absolutely. And she lost also for an, an, an unex, unexpected reason. That is, Jagjivan Ram yes. left Congress and created Congress for Democracy and joined hands with the opposition. And that was something that precipitated the decline of Congress. If Ram had stayed with Congress, the story would have been different, probably. And, and, and a man who had no courage to do anything for two years, when he realized that maybe his turn had come, uh, left uh, Mrs. Gandhi and, and joined hands with Charan Singh, Raji Desai, and, and others. So, and she had to change very quickly the list of candidates after yeah. he uh, left uh, Congress, because she realized that all the candidates Sanjay had nominated right. would not be in a position to fight this, uh, this formidable coalition that was taking shape. And incidentally, uh, Sanjay was not for the lifting of the emergency. He was very much against. Yeah, so coming towards the uh, inspirational part, like uh, uh, inferences from the emergency. So what the positives and negatives one can draw from these two years? The tur turbulence period. Well, I don't see anything positive really. Um, the only positive thing possibly is after the emergency, it was very difficult to promote any kind of authoritarian regime. You know, it, it was a kind of antidote. See, she, she had created a reflex against authoritarianism. Still now, because mm -hmm. after so many decades, uh, things have changed. But that's, that's the only positive um, aspect of, of the emergency. Otherwise, it, it, was, it was a real disaster. It was disaster, uh, of course, politically, 
but uh, it was also a disaster in 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 in, in social terms um, and it had two long term effects and that's why we say that it's a turning point to some extent one criminalization of congress started during the emergency and 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 sanjay had attracted in the party people who had very dubious recalls and who stayed and sanjay will die in 81 but um they will stay behind all these uh, tainted characters and secondly uh, the emergency gave RSS a new legitimacy. Mm-hmm. And uh, not only they could uh, get a better image, but they could also join hands with opposition parties, be part of the um, more desired government. So really, you add a turning point in the long term, you know, structural differences. I mean, Structural features of the Indian uh, Republic uh, had been transformed in these uh, 18 months. So uh, now they're drawing the modern, modern parallel, parallels of democracy, uh, uh, emergency of 1975-77. So what what we can compare with the current regime that we have, where like power is being centralized once again. So yeah. what are the you, parallels? Can you? you you have some common features, and, and, and the one you've just noticed is the most obvious one. Uh, concentration of power in a couple of ends, or clearly, uh, because that has implications of a very similar kind. The chief ministers are appointed from Delhi. The party chiefs at the state level are appointed from Delhi. Uh, you empty out... Right you a, a, a party from the inside uh, so that's clearly one dimension it goes together with erosion of federalism because this is also centralization secondly institutions are also under attack and um, they were more under attack during the emergency for sure but uh, parliament not being a place for debate, that's something we see today uh, to a certain extent as well. And uh, of course, all the agencies, CBI and, and, and co, uh, had lost um, all their autonomy. And, and, and today, this autonomy is also declining. And third, um, the the brand of populism that we saw under Indira Gandhi is reinvented today with one similar effect. Populism brings together people who have nothing in common. Uh, so you see people from completely different social background together for a reason that uh, is transcending the differences. So uh, today it's in the name of uh, nationalism, ethno-religious nationalism, that you have people of many different backgrounds uh, joining ends. Uh, but what is the objective and what is the result? Socioeconomic status quo, growing inequalities, uh, because the idea of bringing together such an heteroclite, uh, heterogeneous coalition uh, is to prevent change from happening, social change from happening. And that's exactly what Mrs. Gandhi wanted to do as well. No change, no socioeconomic change. So these are the similarities. The differences are massive. You can't say that today the situation is similar to what it was in 75, 76, primarily because you don't have 100,000 people behind bars. You have political prisoners, you can say that the Bima Corregan accused are political prisoners, but they are 16. Right. We are 16 till Father Stan Swami died. Uh, there is no comparison. Uh, and, and during the emergency, the kind of torture uh, 
uh, that was experienced by some of these political prisoners uh, was also of a different kind. People died in jail. And secondly, um, the kind of um, censorship that uh, VC Shukla uh, implemented uh, has nothing to do with the kind of self-censorship that you see today, which is which is based on a different modus operandi, uh, IT raids, intimidation, um, sedition cases uh, against journalists, or uh, you 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 make you make appropriators of media houses understand that if they want their other businesses to flourish, they better uh, ease out the journalists who, who, who criticize the, the regime. But that's a different that's a different game. So the comparison is is not necessarily heuristic. And last but not least, mm. Mrs. Gandhi had no plan. Mm. She declared the emergency because it was a survival exercise. But she did not know what to do next day almost. I mean, I, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but the contrast with the very clear agenda of the present government, which wants to transform India into Hindu Rash, mm. it's, it's, it's a very long-term agenda mm. with an ideology beyond with an organization dedicated to this ideology. The contrast there is is, is really striking. Uh, so, uh, if possible, uh, can we discuss you, uh, about your current work and future project that you are working? Well, my my last book uh, is called Modi's India, okay. The Rise of Hindu, Hindu Nationalism and the Rise of Ethnic Democracy. So, it's a study of... Um, the kind of politics that has been um, introduced in 2014. In fact, even before, because there is a chapter on uh, uh, Modi's Gujarat, uh, oh. the launch pad of uh, the policies which will emerge in 2014. So th it's, it's a study of, uh, first, the rise of national populism, what kind of ideology is, Modidva, what kind of technique of uh, propaganda or is it it, it, it it represents? Then there is, of course, one full part on the um, ethnic democracy that India is becoming, not only because of some of, of laws, including the CA, uh, but also because of uh, the role of vigilante groups. And I study very closely what it means for uh, vigilantes to fight against law of jihad or conversion. And the third part is on um, authoritarianism. How are institutions eroding and um, neutralized to some extent? Uh, so this is this is my this is my last uh, book, and the book is uh, um, supposed to be out in India in one week. So oh. you can, you can, uh, yeah, you can, you can lay your hand on it uh, already. So I'm quite excited <laughs> about that. Like we would like to discuss the about that book sooner than later. Yes. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So thank you uh, uh, for discussing uh, in length the emergency and the impact and the takeaway from that uh, for all of us, the young generation and the current generation of You're India. most welcome. You're yeah. most welcome. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> yeah, thanks for joining, uh, Christoph. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hopefully you liked this episode. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Mm -hmm.